yeah. recent and, and new developments and on digital pathology. And uh, we call them Laura Barbasoni from University of Miami, USA, also Laura is Italian origin, but uh, she spent uh, several years now in the States. And More she's half of my life. Yeah, I, 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 I assume. And, um, She's um, Division Chief of Renal Pathology in Miami, but more importantly, she's, she, she is the incoming uh, president of the Renal Pathological Society, so next year's president. And we look very much forward to your presidency, Laura. Thanks for coming. And she will talk on digital pathology applications for renal pathology. <laughs> so thank you for this nice introduction. Um, I want to talk about uh, something that is becoming really uh, the um, state of the art uh, for what we do in pathology and what has been done so far, which are the applications and which are also the, and I want to take you a little bit uh, to the future and back here, how we can look to the future and using this technology and how, what we can do today to reach that goal. So when we talk about digital pathology, um, we talk about uh, uh, glass slides that are scanned into all slide images and stored in a database in a digital pathology repository. Digital pathology is part of virtual microscopy together with telepathology. Differently from digital pathology, telepathology is the transmission of the, of the image uh, that can be viewed uh, in a remote site. Um, why digital pathology is becoming so popular, why it is being implemented in many of the um, uh, um, things that we do today, there are several advantages. First of all, it facilitates the workflow. So it allows the remote access by multiple users, for example, to the same image that can be used over and over again. We don't need to be in a, a clinical studies or uh, for other purposes, we don't need to uh, mail the, the precious glass slides from one side to another. Um, and so in this way, we can create a permanent uh, in library of data and images. So although there is an initial investment, with time there is abutment of the cost. Uh, also, if you think about <coughs> clinical trials and if you think about um, clinical research, it provides transparency for collaborators and for regulatory agencies. So it's not longer what I see in my, on my desk, on my microscope, I'll tell you what it is, but you actually can check it. Um, uh, also facilitate standardization of processes to maximize compatibility, interoperability, repetitivity, quality, and facilitate, and this is very important, commodization of formerly custom processes. Um, also, it, it helps us to increase accuracy, uh, to uh, do reproducibility tests and increase reproducibility, and I want to show you why. And to apply quantity pathology, if you think about how we um, practice pathology, it, our pathology, the pathology diagnosis are quantity. Uh, we, 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 it's, uh, there are holistic processes. Um, and uh, the use of digital pathology are actually help us to add more numbers to our um, interpretation. Um, also allows uh, the, uh, and, uh, the quantitative pathology, uh, the, the demand of it, uh, arose uh, from the need of quantitation, objectivity, consistency. And this is a very important point, awareness that parameters detectable uh, quanti with a quantitative pathology, with a quantitative analysis, would otherwise escape our attention if we don't do that. Uh, digital pathology also allows us different modality of assessment from visual morphology, visual morphometric to computational imaging. And also let us uh, move to a new science, the computational network pathology, where which is quantitative pathology generating biologically and clinically relevant information using mathematical models at the individual and population level and leading to diagnostic and outcome predictive uh, algorithms with the goal to contribute with structural information to the help of data, clinical data, research data, etc., characterize patients according to standardized structural parameters, advance precision and predictive medicine. So, um, how do we use the digital pathology, the virtual pathology in general, in clinical practice? Well, we use both telepathology and most like imaging digital pathology. 
The digital pathology can be used for second opinion. Uh, we store the, 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 the slides and we give uh, permission to somebody else to look at in our database. Or for primary diagnosis under certain Cisco sciences. And Europe is very different from US. Mm -hmm. um, telepathology, when do we use that? Well, we can use that also for consultation. Um, but uh, the most practical use that I see today is, for example, uh, for the pre-transplant tissue evaluation. Very often tissue, uh, kidneys are harvested in uh, um, remote places where there are no expert pathologists. This is one use that we can, um, this one application of telepathology, we can have a better use of our expertise from remote site and simply connect to the um, um, uh, uh, computer and uh, assess the um, um, frozen tissue. And we know that when we harvest kidney, we have um, poor reproducibility of data that we provide, and uh, very often kidneys are not evaluated properly, so there are a lot of issues. The other way we can use that pathology is, for example, for the um, um, evaluation of adequacy at the time of the biopsy itself of the fresh <laughs> tissue. Everything you do you need to validate in your own laboratory. So for example, we validated this process. We um, um, had biases that are done in satellite uh, um, centers, and so, so we connect and we evaluate the tissue. And to, to um, validate this process, we took 17 consecutive renal biopsies done in a satellite process, uh, center, and we uh, compare them with, with the biopsies that were done um, centrally where we are present at the time of the biopsy. And so uh, in, uh, well, we assessed the biopsy by telepathology in eight of the 17 cases. There were three or more uh, cores that were needed to, to have diagnosis for a maximum of five. All um, uh, renal biopsies had glomerular except for one case where there were no glomerular by immunofluorescence or electromicroscopy. And when we compared that to oh, <coughs> biopsies that were assessed conventionally by being present, physically present at the time of the biopsy, uh, six of the ten cases had three or more cores uh, so it were needed. That means that the two cores were not quite enough. And, um, and again, the, the number of glomeruli was uh, very much similar to what we had for pathology. So we use that the, the, the technology uh, commonly right now. So digital pathology has also been used for uh, the test reproducibility of conventional classification system in clinical uh, practice. And this is an example a few years ago, but still very valid, where the investigators uh, look at the reproducibility of the bump classification and the bump scores by uh, digital pathology and compared to uh, light microscopy and concluded that the digital pathology, uh, using digital pathology, there was greater reproducibility. Another study conducted by uh, by uh, the office was uh, um, utilized digital pathology for uh, transplant biopsies. Um, she collected biopsies from many, many centers, and she was able to evaluate inter-observer variability of histopathologic findings, comparing frozen to formally fixed um, tissue and to wedge versus needle biopsy. So providing a lot of information, not only from one center, but from different centers collaborating together. And also, to, she, she used that technology to correlate consensus histopathologic findings with graph outcome in a core biopsy uh, from um, uh, international medical centers. Uh, the uh, application of digital pathology was really initiated by clinical trials, now by clinical in the clinical setting. And uh, this was the case, uh, and, and now is actually the, uh, the, the standard of, uh, of what we do for clinical trials. The first um, clinical trial that um, uh, used um, digital pathology was Fibray, a trial, a trial on Fibray disease. But if we look at historically, the, the very first trial by Genzyme utilized conventional light microscopy. When we uh, do clinical trial for Fibray disease, we're asked to evaluate the amount of GL3 inclusion in interstitial capillaries. And that can be done using semi-quantitative or quantitative pathology. So what happens is that pathologists look at 
or used to look at but that might have to be count GA3 inclusions and quantitative or quantitative in 300 interstitial capillaries per biopsy, pre and post treatment. So this had good results, but if you, th if you think about how this happens, you have to circulate the slides and then everybody has to meet somewhere and have a consensus view. Uh, so um, this was, uh, they also has some limitation because pathologists look at the same cases, but not necessarily the same 300 interstitial capillaries. So digital pathologies was introduced and we created a new protocol that um, has uh, a, an annotated pathologist. So the uh, pathologist goes into the um, digital, into the was like image and select 300 uh, interstitial capillaries that are marked with a number and a number. And the other two pathologists now are scoring exactly the same, the same capillaries. And by doing so, we also did a, a pilot study where we compare the scoring by line of conventional line microscopy versus digital pathology on annotated capillaries. And obviously, as expected, um, reproducibility increased. And in a third, um, uh, a total of three clinical uh, trial of fibrous disease, um, we uh, used the same protocol. Uh, we collected all the biases. And in this protocol, we actually compare also the, um, because we can use at this point, the biases are always there accessible. We uh, compare the uh, semi-quantitative to the quantitative scoring system. So we were able to apply different scoring system to see which one can be used, which one is better. And another thing that uh, um, I, I think I needs to be pointed out, if you think about uh, these clinical trials and you're, you're looking at 300 interstitial capillaries and now you have a discrepancy, right, between the two pathologies, you need to have an adjudication. So normally, uh, the, uh, the third pathologist, the adjudicator, will have to rescore all 300 capillaries to come up with uh, uh, some adjudication. But now, because the capillaries are enumerated and they're marked, the adjudication can occur only on the subset of capillaries where there is a discrepancy. So it really increases the workflow for everybody. And uh, what, doing these studies, we, uh, Charles, myself, and Bob Coleman, annotated and scored over 54,000 capillaries. So, um, which are the applications in clinical research, and in particular in precision medicine? Um, so, when we talk about precision medicine, we need to think about now we switch to a different uh, arena. And we need to think about an integrated view of renal pathology, more integrated than what we do clinically today. Right? So, different different field has to come and play and be interconnected with each other. How does a digital pathology uh, help us in doing so? And I think it's becoming very important. If we want to do integrated pathology, we need to build it on a very solid base. And uh, the uh, permanent web-based image repository is, is really a way to, to do that because you can also associate meta multi-axial metadata to it. But also, the use of digital pathology allows you to uh, elevate the digital images from a passive role to a more active role. What does it mean, active role? That you can do content-based image retrieval. So, don't only look at the biopsy and say what you want to say, but you can have the computer uh, retrieve information from the image itself. Uh, allows you to um, uh, um, implement standardized process, quality assurance. When you have done all of this, now you have your basis, and you can start with your assessment of structural changes. And now, because you have a different a platform, you can apply different methodologies at the same time. You can do morphologic <coughs> profiling of the, of the biopsy, morphometric profiling, use biomarker, biomarker profiling, and to computer-aided analysis. So we started this, so this is an example of how, um, and the, the first example of a digital pathology repository for clinical research that we set up many years ago now. 
Um, and that has become very handy as the uh, procedure of medicine is becoming uh, you know, sort of very popular right now. So we created a digital pathology repository collecting cases from uh, 32 centers for Neptune, and now we have another QGN, another uh, consortium where we collect cases from 60 plus centers. Um, the images, the was like images, are the stores the digital pathology repository. And again, we have a protocol that, that allows us to um, annotate the uh, images and, and enumerate the glomeruli across all the levels. So glomerulus number one maintains this number um, and its identity until we don't see it anymore. We are able to sort of reconstruct the glomeruli throughout the level. But we also, now that we have this system, we also play a lot with different protocols for scoring these biopsies. So instead of using conventional classification system, which are holistic approaches and really do not match what we need to do for uh, precision medicine, we apply a scoring system that is based on observational data that we call this, uh, descriptors that capture the individual structural changes. And we collect them in a uh, um, electronic score sheets where we have all our descriptors on this side. Here we have the glomerular number. <coughs> so as the investigator goes through all the level and through all the enumerated glomeruli, can click on the, uh, the appropriate cell each time they see the descriptor. So this is very objective. It's, it's, it's a little bit, the, the interpretative bias doesn't play a lot, a big role here. And so we conduct and collect raw data. Um, this system is very comprehensive. So we don't, we don't, uh, we have over 80 parameters that we evaluate, and those are inclusive of parameters that are used conventionally by um, our conventional classification system, like the tip lesion, but also parameters that uh, we never use and never make it to a classification system the presence of home cells, for example, the presence of hyalinosis, or the presence of global sclerosis. There is no a single classification system that has global sclerosis as one of the parameters to, um, to evaluate. Um, and also, for example, um, we can uh, um, study the status of the endothelium, the status of the protocyte beside the process effacement, etc. Um, this uh, system has been um, implemented by um, other uh, consortia so that now everybody is uh, trained to use the uh, same um, uh, electronic scoring matrix for digital uh, morphologic assessment and digital morphometric assessment, but also allows us to capture the same type of data across different consortia and across different populations and now we can compare. Um, how digital pathology can help us in many ways. One is uh, to increase accuracy of what we do. If you think about one of the main things that we do, the first thing that we do when we look at the biopsy, we count the glomerula, right? And how accurate are we doing so? Well, if we, I think we, we, we rely too much on our visual spatial memory. And, uh, and very often we count the same glomerulus twice or uh, we don't count it because we think it's another one, etc. And we have proven actually using the annotation system of digital pathology that when we count glomerulus by microscopy, we're pretty wrong with an average of 12 glomeruli per case. So we underestimate the number of glomeruli by light microscopy. And the more glomeruli we have, the more we're wrong. Up to 10 glomeruli per, per biopsy. And we did this study using 277 cases and nine, over 9,000 uh, <coughs> and compared the glomeruli that were reported versus those that were annotated in the same case. This uh, was, uh, this, we have the same uh, results across 32 centers. So, you know, some people are better than others, but everybody's pretty wrong. And, uh, and, we're <laughs> and uh, also, we didn't notice any difference, so it doesn't matter what the diagnosis is. So if you think about how important that is, like think about lupus, you know, the percentage of uh, affected glomeruli is very, so you better count right. So we look at that, well, well, what do we do? If, let's try the percentage of more risk of optic glomeruli. Are we counting them correctly? So, and again, we are not, but 
that we're a little bit better. So um, it, we're still wrong when we come to what is chromatic glomerulite. In this case, it's dependent. Depend, we, we do better for certain diseases. We pay more attention since for certain diseases versus others. Um, but because we are wrong counting the total number of glomerulite and we are wrong to counting the total number of globally sclerotic glomerulite, the percentage is not as wrong. Two wrong make one right. So. Um, so it's not that bad when we look at percentage. So digital pathology, which are the implications of digital pathology? What can we do with digital pathology? What can we do with the ability of having this raw data that capture all the structural changes uh, in the in the renal biopsy? Well, we can still do what we always did, pathologies-driven categorization. We select the parameters that we want to use. And so we create classification system, we retrieve conventional classification system because the parameters are included. Uh, we can explore the predictive value of individual parameters that are not included in classification, conventional classification system, and identify new categories. We can do data-driven patient categorization, and I will show you this in my next talk this afternoon. Or we can train the computer to, for uh, visual feature recognition and for visual and sub-visual feature extraction. And we can also use this data and digital pathology to integrate, to integrate uh, everything into a new sort of uh, morphoomic science. Integrate pathology. So, for example, um, we can explore the predictive value of individual descriptors that are not included in the conventional classification system. Let's take global sclerosis again. Um, from the studies previously done by um, Rule and Kramers, we know that uh, uh, everybody is allowed to have a certain number of, a certain percentage of globally sclerotic glomeruline that increases with age. But if you go above that number, you have a lack of to progress into chronic kidney disease. So we use different diseases, 125 biopsies from, uh, from cases of minimal chain disease, membranous FSGS. And um, we, um, we, we look at the number of global sclerotic glomeruli, and we notice that independently from the underlying diagnosis, including also minimal chain disease, if you have a number, a percentage of global sclerotic glomeruli that exceeds that expected for age, your likelihood of progression is increased. So here we have a parameter that we really kind of do not include in our classification system, but has a very powerful prognostic uh, power. What else can we do using this part? and play with all this data. Well, we can create a different way of stratifying patients. For example, we can use the, um, uh, the individual group of descriptors as inclusion or exclusion criteria and see how patients stratify. And we can re recreate using segmental obliteration. We can create two major categories using uh, the parameters that we use for conventional classification system. We can retrieve conventional classification system. But because we capture also um, other parameters that are not always captured um, by conventional classification system, we can explore other categories. For example, those cases where there is halinosis but not segmental sclerosis. There is a foam cell but not segmental sclerosis. Or an adhesion, a literal adhesion, but not quite a solidification of the top. What do we do with those cases? And now we can dissect them out. In clinical trials so far, they were either pushing to this category or pushing this other category, right? Depending on the pathologies. If we use the segmental obliteration as an exclusionary criteria, we can come up with other classes, but minimal chain disease is one, of course, if there is full, full effacement. But what about those cases where there is no segmental sclerosis? There is full or partial effacement. But there is global sclerosis that exceeds that expected for age, right? Are those really minimal change disease? Because the expectation is that they don't do well. So we can dissect them out now because we have this criteria that can be used as inclusion and exclusion and have the ability to study and see what they're doing. 
Um, we can also look at uh, individual descriptors to predict outcome, as we did with and, and, uh, and gene expression across proteinuric diseases, for example. We know that uh, from these studies that interstitial fibrosis correlates with global sclerosis, arteriosclerosis, tubal atrophy, but also with uh, uh, outcome as more interstitial fibrosis, you have kind of the EGFR. But from these studies, we were also able to uh, start integrating the pathology findings with the molecular findings. And for example, Laura Mariani showed that the percentage of interstitial fibrosis can predict the activation of inflammatory pathways. And if you think about therapy, this stuff being very important because maybe we don't necessarily want to treat the, the conventional disease, but we want to start to treat the pathways that is altering. <clears throat> what are the novel approaches that we start applying? And the first few papers just start coming up this year, I have to say, um, is uh, artificial intelligence. And that you can apply only if you have a, a digital image. Um, a deep learning algorithm and convolutional network uh, network. What is deep learning? Deep learning is an assembly of trainable mathematical function and it involves the use of multiple layers of convolutional network network for unsupervised learning um, of features in order to identify the object of interest from a set of training images. What does it mean? That we train the computer, the computer series of image, we segment them out, say, so look at this, look at this, look at this, and the computer start doing it by itself, right? And provides information about tissue, type cellular, subcellular status, the aggressiveness of disease, and with the goal to um, come up with some uh, molecular, uh, biological, and chemical analysis as well. So, why is this becoming very important? Well, we can do very simple things, but we can also be, do things that are more sophisticated that human would not be able to do. In this first report by VJ, he um, used uh, the um, uh, uh, convolution network on uh, uh, what's like images of trichrome stain uh, arena biopsies, and um, uh, and. Uh, um, use uh, several training classes um, to um, compare the amount of decision fibrosis and correlated with creatinine, proteinuria, EGFR, and uh, year of survival. And construct a different model from the output classes um, and uh, found out that actually the computer was able to perform better than pathologists when it came to predict the, um, for example, the proteinuria. So the way it works is that you have first a set of images that you use to train the computer, and then you have another set of images that you, that you use to validate and see if the computer has learned enough. And so what we do that, when he did that, he found out that the computer was able to predict better creatinine, uh, proteinuria, survival, EGFR, than pathologies. Another project that we are conducting in the setting of Neptune is the Neptune asset, the Neptune Digital Pathology Based Analytic Histonic Interrogation Platform. Um, the overall uh, overreaching goal is to facilitate the development of decision support tools for the discovery of structural changes that can reveal molecular mechanisms <coughs> for prognostic biomarkers. So the idea is to develop a low-cost image analysis to identify structural predictors of kidney disease risk, to define high precise boundaries uh, to map omics on the tissue, and to construct deeply annotated comprehensive tissue uh, uh, kidney analysis for multi-scale morphomic-based categorization of renal disease. So this is done in different layers, right? So which are the application? Number one, well, computer, find me the domain by. So I know I'm wrong by that microscopy. It takes me a lot of time to annotate them manually. But now the computer, computer, find me the domain by. Find me the globally sclerotic domain by. Give me the equation based on age. 
So this is an immediate application, for example, that we can go back and say, I can use that in clinical setting, because now I have in my report a data that I can use and interpret and I have all my other stuff, but I already have somebody who can't really the global sclerotic and told me whether it's good or not good. Um, it, but in this, in the second of the action access, what we will create three, will be done in three different stages. First, we, we are creating actually a, a functional, a foundational uh, toolbox. So the ability to have all the tools to recognize the individual structural changes of the <coughs> layer, right? That will be enriched by a sub visual feature extraction. Um, and later on, it will be further enriched by morphoomic fusion art. What does it mean? Well, these are the various steps that we are taking. First, we train the computer to recognize, oops, sorry, to recognize the different features, the glomerular, like the tubules, the vessel, normal and abnormal histologic primitives. We call them histologic primitives because they are just the, the abnormal tubules, etc. We can teach the computer to measure the density, for example, of histologic primitives. Not only to measure the density of the male line, which we can, we can and cannot really do visually, but think about the density of interstitial capillaries. Visually, certainly, we cannot do it, right? Um, and also, uh, the computer will teach the computer to um, extract sub-visual features. What are the sub-visual features? Things that we cannot see. We look at the bias and say, this is bad, <coughs> right? This is not looking good. But the computer can tell us, for example, which is the level of entropy of a biopsy, or which are the level of the nuclear chromatin, or the nuclear size, etc. All these are the features that we really don't uh, uh, capture well, and can be used to be fused or correlated with molecular data. If, for example, in this preliminary study, we look at the uh, subvisual feature structure, the structure of uh, donor biopsies, transplant donor biopsy, and we were able to, using the subvisual features, to predict the genotype, high risk versus low risk for APOL1. Um, last thing I want to talk about is, uh, if I have two more minutes, is the digital pathology and how that has played a key role in the Kidney Precision Medicine Initiative that has been sponsored by the NIH to build the kidney tissue atlas. So the whole idea is now we're moving from a monolayer, monodimensional or bidimensional um, evaluation of this patient to a multidimensional evaluation of the patient, a characterization of the patient that has to include uh, the entire knowledge that we have, that is uh, knowledge that is based on pathology, on morphologic features, on clinical features, and on molecular features, using conventional assessment, but also less conventional assessment. And the integration and the, 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 the collection and integration <laughs> of all this data to, um, uh, basically forms what we call the KPMP knowledge environment. <coughs> How do we put it together? Well, we put it together creating an atlas that fuses all these elements. And you can enter the atlas from different points. You can enter the atlas from pathology with pathology queries. You can enter the atlas with clinical queries or molecular queries. So your atlas, for example, if you enter from the pathology queries, you will have the ability to ask information about uh, the, uh, the doing a text search or an image search, ask information about the conventional cat categorization of the patient, but also um, um, query the atlas using descriptors. <coughs> so how many of these patients, or does this patient have these features, these individual features? So may have diabetic nephropathy as a category, but how about all these other things? Or you can query the atlas using the vector library. A uh, vector library is a, is a, is a, 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 a series of algorithms that um, allow us to um, <coughs> identify individual structural changes utilizing artificial intelligence, obviously. 
and, uh, and you can derive the conventional diagnosis using vector library and descriptor library, and you can use the descriptors to build the vector library. But ultimately, what is important, now you can, because you have the entire knowledge, the entire knowledge environment, and you have a comprehensive category, uh, um, profile of the patient, you can start putting the layer on top of each other. And so you can start mapping what are the um, 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 different topics <coughs> for that patient on the uh, individual structural changes that you see in the kidney that you can retrieve using the descriptor library or the vector library, etc. You can enter the um, atlas utilizing clinical information and ask queries about the individual uh, clinical features as conventionally uh, determined. Um, does this patient have a GFR of that, etc.? Or using conventional clinical classification or outcome measurements. But you can also query the atlas using artificial intelligence based clinical feature aggregates and novel outcome definition. And so art information, basically you look at the same clinical data and you start analyzing them in a different way. And again, you can then overlap your clinical information depending on how you want to look at them and you can map them on the histology and the molecular feature to redefine molecular diseases. Last, you can enter the atlas from the, from the omic <coughs> side. And so you can uh, use a catalog of molecules that are present in renal diseases to query you, the atlas. You can <laughs> use a map, you can map them on uh, external annotation tools and looking at pathways. Or you can use a higher order of analysis tools, for example, the tissue treatment response signature. And again, you can then map the omic signature on the clinical and histologic features. So basically what I showed you before, all these elements that are kind of uh, <coughs> put together, now they can be mapped on the structural features. And you can do that just because you have the images as digital images, and uh, you can reconstruct all these elements. So basically the idea is that of using a high throughput unbiased profiling of the kidney and the patient. Different um, uh, people are obviously involved in this, uh, in this project and each of them will apply different technologies to, for the uh, uh, molecular profile to come up ultimately with an integrated single cell functional uh, kidney map. Basically, everything will be mapped on the uh, structural changes. Summary of that. So, if you think about diseases and the use of digital pathology, um, the disease specific information is, is obviously spread across different landscapes, right? And so, we need to know, and the digital pathology is helping us, how do we align all this knowledge? How do we extract it? from the images, for example, how do we represent it and how do we fuse it with all the other elements in order to provide decision support tools for pathologists, clinicians, <coughs> researchers, but also patients. And so digital pathology grants better use of pathology material not possible with standard glass slides. These improvements allow for capturing granular structure information, broader profiling and superior integration with other data sets. And there is obviously an increasing role for quantitative pathology and deep learning to address questions in precision and predictive medicine by providing new opportunities for pathomics and uh, molecular features to create fused predictors of outcome and to guide both conventional as well as targeted therapeutic approaches. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, very interesting topic. I think there are some questions in the interest of time. I think we'll limit it a little bit. Maybe two or three questions. Hello. Um, uh, thank you, Laura. You have been working very hard. And I think those who say you are a dangerous woman <laughs> are wrong. 
right. Because what actually you are saying is that our brain doesn't work so well. We know that. So um, our uh, studies for the BAMF group uh, that I did um, for the donor biopsies, uh, digital evaluation, and your studies that I have read so far show that our brain is good in qualitative assessment of the renal biopsy, but not quantitative. So we ask the computer to help out, making us more precise. And now I see that some of the studies in Neptune have incorporated more quantitative software, where you ask the computer to count, because we don't count very well, and so on, estimate fibrosis, and so on. Now, there is one element that the computer has not yet addressed, and I would like to ask your comment. The nephrologist is not only an interpreter of a slide, but is a consultant pathologist for the nephrologist. How do you think the NIH is thinking about incorporating the knowledge which is vast and continues to increase for uh, consultative purposes? So I don't think, that, so we have to look at this. This is a very hot topic, right? So are we going out of business? Yes. No, <laughs> no we're not. That's a question. <laughs> exactly. That, that was like it. I summarized it. Okay. No. But I think we have to start doing business differently. So if you think about Kodak, right? Kodak was, uh, was uh, uh, the monopoly of the market of uh, photography. And when Kodak was offered to go digital, they said, like, oh, no, no, we have our films. We're good. Huh. <laughs> right? Who used them? Who used them today? So we don't have to be, we, we have to be careful not to be caught up. And uh, so um, what we want to do as, uh, as, as a society, uh, different societies, as freedom apologists, is work in the next couple of years, because this is moving fast, this is moving really fast. How are we going to train ourselves and the new generation of freedom apologists to be integrated pathologist. I know you understand me. I know. I know you want to go. So, and, and this is what the goal we should have. Some of us may not say, well, I don't want to learn artificial intelligence. That's fine. But how do I let the field to move toward us? Because it's inevitable and uh, just this year, there are like five papers that came up. And it's just a question of time before we are working on now uh, this going for the global sclerosis. And uh, there's what we can offer to the clinicians. Like, here's an story. You still practice pathology, you still be a consultant, but now you have to use different information to consult. And that is what is. It's not you're out of business. You're out of business if you stop reading the, the literature. But that has always been the case. It's just will be a different literature now. Okay. Thank you, Laura, for uh, being interested in a very inspiring talk. My question is, in, for example, in our department, we switched into uh, digital, digital pathology last year. Uh, we've been trying different, um, well, different brands available in the market. And, one of the most important things I, uh, I, I mean, finding about uh, sharing all this stuff is that, first of all, uh, different brands work with different files. They're always not compatible. How's, what's your opinion about uh, the developing of these algorithms? How can we somehow make everything compatible so we can all work together without this uh, babble tower that we're in right now? So, so one of the, the things that I was key is standardization, right? Standardization of protocols, and, and in KPMP we're working on it. So we created a pilot study to look, for example, how processes are standardized across the different centers and how are the results. Because we all learn how to read through our imperfect slides. Uh, you can interpret your slides very well. If you give them to me, I just like I'm not. It, it, 
I'm not used, my eyes is not used to your h &E, for example, right? But the machine is different now. And so the machine has to, and to do the studies is not only one center, you have to use multiple centers. So the machine has to learn to read through the different sections. And we are creating algorithms to adjust, but at the same time, you can adjust only that much. And so, one of the, actually I was talking to Surya and other people, one of the things that I want to do next year, and I want to welcome everybody who wants to be part of this committee, it will be very important. How do we standardize the pre analytics Because there is where we always fail. And now that we have digital pathology, it's gonna slap us in the face, right? We got away with it, but now we can't anymore. It will be all digital. So, as a society, how do we standardize and how do we implement it? Because we have written papers about standardized renal biopsy, but how do we implement it? This, that was just a suggestion, right? How do we actually make people do it? And that would be critical. And so, um, Jan Baker, um, Surya, um, what's his name? I forgot his name. Um, somebody else, I asked them to put together a committee for next year and work on it. And everybody who wants to be part of it is, is welcome because I think this has to touch everybody. Um, but the pre analytic is key. We, it was easier, the post analytic <coughs> was easier to standardize it because uh, we. You know, we have the electronic scoring sheet, everybody uses it, we have training <coughs> sections, everybody is on the same page. The analytic, uh, you know, we can work on it. But one of the major problems, for example, that we have in one of the um, um, integrate centers uh, is uh, uh, the urinomics. The, uh, there is extreme variability in, in Europe more than everywhere else. And so many of the cases, and I think uh, Sandri look at them, were not readable. They're simply not readable. So you can't do anything. Yeah, in fact, in Spain, uh, the last uh, year in our national pathology meeting, we talked about this, about standardizing. Since we all want to participate and integrate studies and some biases come from the, some place, some, it's not reproducible. So unless we standardize the protocol, pre -analytic pre -analytic. protocol especially because most of the places still make four uh, sections, and it makes more four sections, you're going to It goes before that. It goes like the time, for example, what we're doing in KPMP is the pre analytics start how much time before you take the bias and you put it in formula or you freeze it. So you have to standardize from there. Because the bubbling comes from sitting on the desk, right? Um, so, so we are looking at all that um, and, and sort of we come up with a standardized protocol, has to be time and uh, the, 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 the media have to be the same media, of course. Uh, so 10% buffer formalin, etc. versus others. But that, that's kind of easy, but um, yeah. And uh, so I want to, for next year, I really want to stress and make a big point about standardization. It's in my, it's what I do, but I think it's also what we need. Yeah, sorry. Okay. In uh, six weeks time at the ASM, uh, uh, Aviv Regev is, is speaking on October 26th on the Human Cell Atlas project. It's a bit confusing. It's so similar to the terms that you use. But the Human Cell Atlas project is single cell transcriptomics, um, a huge project. It will be larger than the Human Genome uh, Project. It will impact all of, uh, all of pathology. I talked about it at, at the BAMP uh, 2017 meeting. And your most exciting slides at the far right, they all end with that, the, the single cell. So I, I just want you all, all to know what the potential there is. Right now, it's four to six cents per cell. 
You can analyze a million cells at a time, and this is going to impact every one of you, even though who, those of you who are listening are think, you know, it's nothing to do with me. It will change everything. When you think about the way we're doing transcriptomics now, often it is blind, like you do a kidney biopsy. You take a piece, you don't even know that it's kidney. It's just a piece of tissue obtained during a kidney biopsy. You don't know what it is. And you analyze the whole thing. It's gross tissue transcriptomics. That is so different from looking at individual cells. The power of looking at you know, individual cells is going to be something amazing. So the only criticism I have of this talk is you really don't talk about that. <laughs> and the other thing is, those of you looking at promotion for the ASN, you'll find, you know, Aviv Regev's name is all over every promotional thing. They show four people giving plenary talks. She's one of them. But they don't list her topic. They list the topic of the other three. There's some force that's against this idea I'm of promoting not, yes. single cell <laughs> transcriptomics. So I don't want you to be a part of this. So the next time, I, I'd like you to say Human yeah, Cell yeah. Atlas Project, yeah, yeah. single cell transcriptomics, and give the audience the idea of how exciting <laughs> this area is. Thank you. <laughs>